and welcome to The Nightcap. It's life behind the Michelin star, a late night lock-in here where we candidly discuss and debate all things culinary over a few drinks. Right now, I am sat upstairs at Salt Restaurant in Stratford up Avon, Shakespeare's home. Service is wrapping up downstairs, so let me introduce myself and what the hell we're all doing here. I'm Simon Alexander, a podcaster, producer, and daytime cooking show contestant. To my left, playing host, Michelin star head chef of Salt, Mr. Paul Foster. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, yeah good. Thanks, mate. And our guest today is group chef director at the Pig Hotels and Sunday brunch regular is Mr. James Golding. How are you doing, buddy? I'm really good. Really Excellent. happy to be here. Yeah, you look. You came up glowing from your meal. <laughs> well, I've just had an amazing meal, honestly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it your first time here? Yes, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What did you make? Sparing his blushes, what did you make of the food? What was the... Uh, any standout bits? I mean, absolutely. Uh, tartar. I mean, you know, I'm a big steak tartare man, and, yeah. and, and it was it was absolutely perfect. That dessert, by the way, I've just had. That's why I'm beaming. You know, I love I oh, love the wild the, rice ice cream. Yeah, yeah it's Ooh, nice. so really we'll talk good. us through that yeah, a little really bit. Good. I love um, that sort of. So thing. we deep fry the wild rice to like how you would to puff it up, mm. but it gives it this really nutty, cereally taste. So we infuse that into the dairy overnight, oh. and then pass it off, and just make a simple ice cream with it. it but it's a real cereally kind of flavour. That's yeah, yeah. with miso toffee, white chocolate mousse, caramelised white chocolate. It's wheel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a really sort of Moorishy kind of. That sounds right. Much. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think that's what made it for me. So a lot of people are doing this caramelised white chocolate now, but because you put that crunch in there. Yeah, you put the foil through it. Yeah, yeah. it just make, it takes it to another level and it gives it a real texture, which you don't. It was yeah. stunning. Oh, we really did. Good. Good really good. Wear. I loved it. Oh, that's, yeah. It's just reminded me that during last summer when we did all of our Ask Us Anything podcasts, we were both convinced that you could infuse milk with cereal and sell that yeah <laughs> that is my favorite thing to drink i yeah. think that that is oh, yeah. in essence what you're doing <laughs> love it okay well coming up on today's podcast uh, we're going to be talking to james and paul about uh, hunting killing and preparing animals we're going to be talking about judging food competitions as always we'll take some of your questions you've sent us via the nightcap twitter and instagram pages and we'll do the usual bits boiling point cowboy stories etc etc before we get into that, though, this is a nightcap. Once again, for Series 4, we are opening a beautiful bottle every episode of Gusborne's finest award-winning English wine. Uh, you can visit their website now. Go to gusborne.com, see which of their very special vintage releases you might like to purchase and enjoy at home, all with free UK mainland delivery. No minimum order required. T's and C's done. What we got, mate? So, we've got. you'll be familiar with this. I know you've got it on your, your list. I saw it when I was down there. So, Gusborne... The Pinot Noir. We haven't had this on our oh, list for a while because like, through lockdown they sold out so much of their still and it was hard to get. Mm. So we've, um, yeah, this is the 2020 Pinot Noir. I haven't probably drank any for nearly a year. Yeah. But yeah, yeah absolutely stunning. We have had this on the podcast before, but mm. I've not tried the 2020. So oh, interesting to see. Just the colour of that is absolutely stunning, isn't it? Do you have the Pinot Noir on your list? I know you have the... You have the Blanc de Blanc, you have the <coughs> Guinevere Chardonnay. Yeah, so, so when, when, we, um, when we opened the uh, Piggott Bridge place, we, um, obviously we were slap bang in the middle of wine, British wine com- country yep. sort of thing. So um, we gave <coughs> most of the local Kentish wine producers a little slot in our cellar. Mm. So, so what they could do was they could leave some of their good bottles down there so that when they entertained, they could come to the Pig at, uh, at Bridge. So these guys were big uh, supporters of that little yeah you know idea yeah. but yeah, yeah we, 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 we're big like you we're yeah. big fans Great of stuff. Them. fantastic Great stuff, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it really is it's, it's nice stuff. to taste that again it's yeah familiar. yeah familiar but like oh, i just love it okay so let's get into our first topic then um hunting killing and preparing animals it, we've touched on bits of these questions uh, bit, bits of these themes in in podcasts over the, the last couple of years but i thought it'd be a great opportunity to talk to you james about it and and that sort of plugged in really well to the sorts of the ethos of the pick hotels to set the context can you tell us first a bit about sort of the ethos of those kitchens at the, the hotels how, how there's several now is there like yeah eight so, so we've got eight now yeah. eight hotels so yeah it all began back in well for me it began 2009 so um i i met robin hudson when i was head chef out in soho house new york and we you know, we worked together for about a year and a half out there and then um, came over to, to the UK and and we, we sort of lost contact for a bit. And then one day I saw him on the front of, uh, uh, I think it was the business pages of the Times doing, you know, this <laughs> in front of Limewood. You know, yeah. and, I, and I was thinking, oh, I know that guy. <laughs> and um, anyway, fast forward a bit, we got in contact. I, I ended up becoming head chef at what at the time was called Whitley Ridge, which was a very sort of classic, slightly stuffy um, mm. country house hotel. 
you know, you go in there, shake the curtains, and you see oh, that little yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of sprinkling dust. Well, <laughs> um, sun, you know, we, yeah. yeah. So, so we operated that for I think it was about a year and a half. What, and then, what attracted you to that place then? If it was little, they just wanted to change tack well, completely, or no? Well, there was a vision. So the vision was obviously to get Limewood open, and then uh, uh, and then do the pig. So, so obviously Limewood Five Red Star Luxury, you know, um, um, hotel owned by Jim Ratcliffe, or sorry, Sir Jim Ratcliffe now. Um, uh, and, and the idea was to create this luxury, beautiful hotel in Lindhurst. So we were in Brockenhurst, which was literally 10 minutes down the road. So we had to be a slightly different product. So the mm-hmm. idea was that they, they'd launched Limewood and then about a year later, I would come along, slightly different, you know, guy that had been in London for a lot of time, been yep. in New York, had dreadlocks down to my bum, <laughs> you know, oh, really? I, I had wow. piercings all over my face. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think Robin probably thought, yeah, this guy will probably shake up the uh, <laughs> the British uh, hotel country yeah, yeah. house. Uh, Absolutely. Scene. Actually, so, I saw a photo of you the other day. Actually, it was on your social media with dreadlocks, a young face. And yeah, oh, yeah it's my wedding anniversary. That was it. That's yeah, right. Yeah, no, my wedding. Yeah, yeah my wedding. wedding video. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so my kids. That's a bold look. Too. It is. Yeah, my wife had it as well. I mean, it, <laughs> it was kind of a little bit same same. Anyway, we won't go into it. Um, it was. Uh, yeah, it was a bowler, but the funny thing was, was I, I, I got the job with, with Robin, and yeah, we had this plan and what I was going to do, and then, and then when I, when I got the job, I suddenly, I, I had these dreadlocks for so long, mm. I thought I can't honestly, it's getting too much. I've got to shave them off, and I shaved them off. Oh wow! And I, well, I walked in literally two days later, and he's like, "What have you done? Were you skinhead?" And like, I said, properly. "Yeah." I was like, oh, <laughs> I, "I like shave them." Off. And he goes, "I wanted you to keep those." And I said, "Well." I, I couldn't keep them on forever. I thought, yeah. new, new job, new start. I shave them <laughs> off. He goes, no. But anyway, it was fine. I grew a Mohican after that. And uh, wow. it, it was all, it was so all this fine. This is actually, the look we see in front of us is quite mm. toned down from previous. Yeah, this is 12 years after. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At some point, you got to, but you know, whatever. But uh, it's, you know, it's, um, it, it was it was a great time. And we, we shut it down. They did the refurb. We opened 2011. And yeah, we're now, what are we? Yeah hotel number eight but we've had a fantastic journey so far and has the ethos of the food been the same from the very beginning or has that sort of naturally evolved because it feels quite distinctive what you've got going on yeah so 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 when i when i came back from the states um i mean i grew up in the christchurch area which is on the edge of the new forest and and when i was a child you know my my uh, my family was very into their cooking my my mother's or well, my nonna is Italian, and on my dad's side, it's all very English. So I grew up in a family where, at the weekends, we'd we'd be with my with my dad, and we'd be making very British kind of food, you know, which actually changed actually over the years. But with my nanny, you know, she made like the best pork pie, mm. or she make the most incredible macaroni cheese, yeah. you know, or so you know you know the things that you used to eat when you were a kid, and yeah. you you can still taste them now, and you think this is amazing. But with with my with my mum, you know, she almost taught my dad like things like how to make pasta. And I remember walking into the kitchen as a child, and you know, all the pasta like hanging off oh, coat man. hangers all around, and oh, I have amazing. to get involved. I say I had to because it took away from my Mega Drive playing time. But <laughs> you know, it was it was it was one of these things where you know I kind of got involved. And over the years, you know, you sort of realise that this is all part of your DNA and 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 what you're. Yeah. You know, sort of meant to do and, and for me it was just like a natural progression I just loved food and my dad used to take us foraging well I say foraging we, we spend most time whacking each other with sticks while he <laughs> found these amazing <laughs> mushrooms but you know it was it was part wow, of was this it, mushrooms was it that he was picking because yeah, that's, yeah. quite, that's quite a specific like um, there's there could be bad, lots of bad ones and the, the distinctions totally. between oh, them yeah. are very small right? yeah I, I think I'm lucky you've I'm still here yeah. Yeah, you've got to know what you're doing right like, it's, what are you doing there? <laughs> yeah, <that's fine. laughs> but uh, um, no, he he was quite into it, and he I, I I remember him buying the the Roger Phillips book, which is actually a book that I bought. Actually, no correction, my wife bought me this book at a jumble sale when we were I think we were in Salisbury or something like that, and I was I'd had a bad day. I'd had a phone call from somebody that had upset me, and she'd gone and bought me this. Oh, that's sweet. You nice. know th- this this book, this foraging book, and um and and. I'll never forget that, you know, Philip actually came to our first book launch and, and he was the guy that sort of inspired me as a teenager, or sorry, as a, as a chef later in life, remembering mm. my times as a young person foraging to actually get back into foraging and it was, oh. um, yeah, it was quite a big thing for me. But um, yeah, yeah my, my dad was quite switched on, you know, he was never like masses, we could find like a few seps or some in caps or, nice. you know, maybe a few rolls, that'd be it. But, oh, you know, he, he, he used to be one of those sort of 
periods of time where it was a balance between how long he could stay out before we would annoy him so much <laughs> yeah. that we would have to go back to the car <laughs> because right. it was time to go home because you were in trouble. Sort of thing. <laughs> that, was, that was the thing. But. So does the, does the whole foraging thing, because I know like the practicalities around running a restaurant as well, but do you forage and get that stuff into your kitchen yeah. all the time? Well, how does that, how does that so, so originally when it started, when it was literally me and three hotels, you know, when it was Brockenhurst, Pig on the Beach and, and Pig on the Wall, so we would all do it. So the chefs would be out. So we do, obviously, mise en place in the morning, lunch service. Lunch service would finish, and we dedicate an hour and a half every single day to foraging. So wow. you'd have to clean down. Every head chef, uh, sorry, every chef got issued a pair of wellies, hunter wellies. Oh, nice. And that everybody was amazing. out. And we'd be that is out. so yeah. cool. And, and, and we forage, and we go, one day we go through the forest, not the new forest. We go, <laughs> obviously, to the, to the seashore. <laughs> Um, we go through all sorts of woodlands and we basically collect everything that was in season or available at the time. Nice. As the sort of company evolved and as we got bigger and as chefs got less kind of readily available, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, we, we ended up, um, we, we employed foragers. So in Brockenhurst we had Gary, um, uh, Pig on the Beach, we, we've got Giuseppe that still works for us today. And they're full, um, that's their full-time job is yeah, to just yeah. look for food. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, you must need it because they're, they're clearly doing like big covers there as we well. Are. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So, so we pay them. You know, they, they go out, they yeah. forage, they have licenses, they have to show us and prove to us they are, you know, accredited because, you know, when you get people like EHO come in, all those sort of guys, they say, you know, where do you get your well stuff from? And if it's not from, say, a company that supplies it, they want to know who it is and, yeah, you know, yeah. how do you know that it's yeah, legit. safe? And yeah, you yeah. say, this is a guy and all the rest of it. And um, yeah, so, so we have our foragers now and they're great guys and they work really hard for us, yeah. And do they not just forage for on the ground, they hunt as well or no? No, or? no, just, just okay. all, um, no, that's all uh, uh, just forage stuff. I mean, when it comes to hunting, when it comes to our meat, so I, I have a, um, a syndicate that I have, I won't say the name of the estate, but it's, okay. it's over near Andover Way, uh-huh. um, near Stockbridge. And, um, and the guy who, uh, he used to run my syndicate, but now he's actually just the grounds guy for the estate. He gets all of our, he shoots all of our venison. Mm-hmm. So I took my head chefs out there last week. Yeah, no, okay. week before last. Uh, yeah. I've, I've seen on your social, you like going shooting yourself yes. quite a bit. Yeah. What yeah. sort of things do you shoot mainly? Mainly sort of pheasant, partridge, any any sort of wild game that's in season. Yeah. Um, we, we do do deer stalking. Um, I've got my firearms and I, I'm doing my um, <laughs> nice. deer stalking certificates, but it's quite tricky at the moment to sort of find the right estate. So I, yeah. I need to get my uh, qualifications and then I'm also looking into that. But when, when I was a kid, my parents used to work on the Lord Merrick estate. Yeah. So they weren't ever the guns, they were always the beaters. Uh, so, okay. so my first job oh, when wow. I was a kid was to pluck pheasants. So yeah. they used to get paid in pheasants, as you know. When, <laughs> you, know, when you beat, you know, you, you, you work all that season to maybe have a, a pop at the end of the at <laughs> yeah. the end of the season. But sure. nine times out of ten, you might get a you know twenty quid and a couple of brace of pheasants. So that was my job. So when I was, I don't know, when I was sort of eleven, twelve, something like that. You know, wow. I used to get twenty five p a bird. Oh really? So I used to pick pluck sorry um uh, uh the pheasants and partridges and they would all sort of get prepped down and put in the freezer or cooked up depending on mm. you know what we have for dinner and that was our food for the week so Incredible. you know it, imagine like you know someone that would have a chicken and they they roast a chicken and you'd have the breast and then you'd mm. have the cold cuts and then you'd make the broth and you know that's what it was like for us with game in our house you know the game birds were uh, a, a week's worth of food for us amazing my parents God, went that's amazing runners, amazing you know? bring it so, yeah, so in touch with incredible, it incredible yeah like me growing up in like con- concrete coventry just like that was so far removed from whatever our experiences yes yeah. 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 yeah, it's like so much later into are. it yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but i'm i'm trying to get into shooting i've never shot anything I've just got a gun, actually. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That'll never not sound weird, does it? Yeah. Yeah. No, only only an air rifle. Because I wanted to just um, practice with that first, learn, and then yeah. step up, and then do my firearms license and things like that, and do get on a state, do some stories. I wanted mm. to work my way into it. I did get the gun on Instagram. <laughs> I know that sounds dodgy. <laughs> it all sounds like, what did you get? Oh, AK-47. I swapped, <laughs> I swapped it for a book and a knife. Oh, did you? Yeah. Did you? yeah. Oh, wow. It's a guy, a veg supplier when he used to live in Suffolk. He just, he's moving back to Canada yeah. and he put it on. It's a, it's a nice one, as mm. far as I know. Like, yeah. lovely scope on it and everything. Yeah. I showed it to some people and they said it's, it's decent. Oh, nice. It's a good few hundred quid. Yeah. And he needed to get rid of it. So I said, I'll give you a book and a knife. Wow. Um, yeah, and he, he sent it over in a veg box <laughs> from Suffolk. That is, 
in a, he said over a violin case in, 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 the, in the dead of night yeah, yeah. Just then, like, two guys in bowler hats <laughs> came out of it. I sent them a book in a knife yeah <laughs> that is that's a good deal it didn't cost that's me a penny really cool. and there are loads of pellets and that so I've yet to take it out I have okay. like played with it in the yard just got okay. some cans and stuff <laughs> with some cats <laughs> Such yeah. a crazy image of you and I. It's funny. I went in come and then I took my mum out on the, the Monday for Mother's Day lunch and I said to her, oh, she was just chatting house things, anything new. I said, oh yeah, I got a gun. And she, she spat her lunch out. She, and I was telling her about it. She's like, don't let Esme and Ethan play with it. Like, what sort of irresponsible father do you think I am? Like, let my five-year-old and nine-year-old play. I said, no, I'll keep it at work, in the office, away. I'm not going to leave it around the house. I, I, like, I, I said to you earlier on, I thought Shrek was a really nice place. But I, I kept seeing all these posters up with missing cats all around the place. That, that's got to have to do with you. Yeah, do, not, do not go in the backyard here. Do not go I'm not back. a fan of cats. <laughs> But but joking aside, we do we do do these um, so we do these days. So so there's a lot of chefs just like you, Paul, who who are sort of looking to get into mm. to shooting because I think you know as as chefs we are inherently interested in where our food comes from. Of course, yes, and yeah. you know I think this is a whole other conversation. I mean I'm I'm an ambassador for Ely now. I'm a pro uh, uh, still shop person, which is another conversation I mean there's there's a lot of sort of things you know, this is a big rabbit hole that we could go down no, but, sure, yeah. but but um, you know the whole the whole shooting thing you know I, I do this thing within our syndicate where um, so so I have my days throughout the throughout the year and then at the end of the year I it used to be called uh, Rex's day who's my son so his oh, okay. his birthday is on the 31st of January which is the last day of the game season so mm. it was always his day so I always booked it and we do like this mini driven thing so basically it, they, they call it mini room, but it's basically a clear up day. Right. So you basically shoot whatever you shoot. You might get ten birds. You might get fifty birds. You know, it depends on yeah the day. And um and and so as he's got older, he's now, you know, he's I wouldn't say spoiled, but he's <laughs> you know he's been doing this now for a very long time. So yeah. for him, it's like. Oh, yeah, yeah. you know 16 years old oh, <laughs> day with yeah. dad yeah. <laughs> on my birthday you know you know he wants to be with his mates he doesn't want to be out yeah. shooting with dad and his friends so anyway so so what what we've done is now that's no longer rex's day that's now um we call it uh, young guns and, and chef's day oh, okay. so what we do is we get chefs friends people who are interested in shooting down and and um them and their kids Oh, that's so, nice. for example, Drew Baker, you know, he's bought his kid. You know, the pe- people that are interested in shooting who want to get their kids, or even just show their kids where food comes from. I, yeah, I have this day it. where where you come down and it's really laid back. It's really easy. It's really sort of approachable. It's not as sort of stuck up and you know, kind of sometimes a bit formal as they can be. It's mm. just really relaxed environment and. Um, and yeah, we run these sort of days. So if you want to come, that oh, be great. Oh, definitely, yeah. That yeah. sounds a lot, far, a lot further away from, like you say, the stuffy, sort of more formal, old-fashioned way of going about things. And there's places like that that still like that. But yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that the whole sort it's of... It's a good way of introducing changed. young people into it yeah. as well. And, and this being is more approachable. And this is what's going to make it more approachable, is that, you know, pe- people see it in one way, way you know, the, the, the whole... You know, society see it as one way, and, yeah. and the way that they see it is the very traditional way, and the very sort of way that you know some people would like it to be portrayed. Once you once you understand the countryside, once you understand the countryside community, you see a different way to shooting, and it's yeah. not the way that it's portrayed. And you know, and 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 if there was ever, God forbid, a day that it wasn't there, the countryside society would never be the same again, and it wouldn't recover. Mm, right. And um, you know, it, it's not just a way of life; it's also a financial support network for the countryside. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, um, do you remember? Uh, I know you sort of grew up with it, so it might be a bit different. But do you remember shooting an animal for the first time and how that felt? Or was that like a big moment? Was it a bit? I started off the same as Paul. Yeah. I shot a pigeon with an air rifle. <coughs> wow. Yeah. I did. So, uh, well, how did that uh, feel? It's, for it's, like, it's I, you know, without like over <coughs> yeah. sort of making it over dramatic. It's not. It's not an everyday thing to kill something. Y- you know what? So, it, it's it's one of those weird feelings that when when you see a bird in the sky, you appreciate a bird, right? And I mm. appreciate a bird in the sky as much as anybody else. I went out this morning and whacked a magpie that was trying to steal an egg <laughs> out of the out of the little blue tits <laughs> nest in my back garden. I was so angry. I was sitting there on my computer. I just finished a zoom call and I saw him going for it and I was like you 
<laughs> so I went outside and I picked my son been messing around with a trowel and I literally <laughs> <laughs> so I, didn't, I didn't hit it but I, think I whacked the branch that was yeah. right next to it and it nice. freaked out so much and flew away so you know I, it's not that I just want to kill every no, bird of course, yeah. but, but, of course but yeah. the, I do remember when I, when I shot the pigeon and, and the thing is, is that when you shoot an animal which is you intend to kill it to eat mm-hmm. the second that animal dies in your mind it's the same as you picking a chicken off the shelf yes yeah, yeah and yeah. putting it in your basket to yep. take home and cook because Good point. that has gone from something that was alive mm-hmm. to now something that you're going to cook yep. yeah yes there's a bit more preparation involved absolutely and, and it's that whole thing of people see it pre-packaged in a supermarket yeah. it looks very different when it's still yeah. got its feathers and its so, eyes open yeah. you know, so, so the... I, I asked the same question to my daughter so my daughter shot her first pheasant this last season and mm-hmm. she's been shooting for a while mm-hmm. but um, I, I think there's a certain amount of hesitancy there or whatever it was but anyway she, she's had a great season and she shot a, one of the first time she shot a pheasant I said so you know how do you feel darling you're okay I said yeah she said I'm fine dad she said I'm going to take it home we're going to pluck it as we always do because they have the same job as I had yeah. you have to pluck all the pheasants <laughs> pluck and, um, your own pheasants yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you kill it you pluck it you cook it and um, and and, um, and yeah so she um, how she, old is she? 13 13 oh, I mean my son's been shooting since he was 8 oh mm. right and he's very good he's yeah. a very very good shot but um <laughs> But yeah, he puts me in shame. Young, it's like it's young the same. It's, like it's better skier, it's better shooter. You know, it's, that, it's like the, I, I don't even bother competing with him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the youthful reaction yeah. time, isn't it? it you is. just can't buy you that. S- you suddenly feel old. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I think you know. Going back to your question, I think yeah, it, it becomes food, and I think that that's what that's what eating meat is about. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that it goes from being an animal, which you respect because it's alive, because it's it, it you know it, it's it's it is what it is and then at one at some point it dies and then it becomes food and i think that you know that that's part of life and and you you accept that and you say this is how i live and i eat meat or you yeah. don't and you do the v thing yeah, 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 yeah. whatever whatever works do, does it like cross your mind to not care about it that sounds a bit too sort of throwaway but like do you think it'll be a big deal when you come to shoot no i don't think so at all then? no i don't i don't think so i remember like the only things i've ever killed and you know lobster crab those yeah. sort of things yeah. Uh, and I remember the first time I did that when I was, I think, 17 in the kitchen and looked all like an excited teenager mm-hmm. acting like a twat and, <laughs> and <laughs> messing about with it. Yeah. Um, but I do remember thinking, oh, I killed that, but I was very quickly not bothered by it. Sure. And then I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any issues about it at all, mm-hmm. no. You know, the amount of dead whole animals and exactly. the whole deers exactly. I've had on my chopping board and, exactly. you know, I see them in the, you know, their feathered and furred state. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like it's, I'm not used to that at sure. all. So no, I don't. I don't it, think it's interesting though that a lot of chefs, even like I say, even to your standard, but like a lot of chefs have gone this far in their careers, they've never killed anything, and which it's all mm. in proportion to how many animals they've butchered and yeah, prepared. Yeah. It is, it's sort of yeah, like, it's you something I've said for years I've wanted to do. I've just never mm-hmm. really known people or really taken the time. And now I've just thought, well, I'm going to just start making an effort, gradually get mm-hmm. into it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to just go out and buy a rifle and get a firearms license. I want to ease my way into it. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but is there um, an extra element of appreciation from the of the animal when you're butchering it after you've, you know? You, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Th- I mean, this is kind of the basis of our philosophy at the pig. I mean, you know, the the whole thing with even like the kitchen garden. You know, the re- the reason why we had the kitchen garden was because we believed that the chefs would have more respect for products that they've been out and seen grown in the garden and spoken to the, the people that have harvested it and actually brought it to them, you know, in, in the in the kitchen, mm-hmm. you know, which would give them more. And it does, you know, it makes them realise, you know, not mm. to, you know, you don't chop the ends off the carrot and leave an inch on the end. You know, you don't yeah, sort of yeah, like, that, yeah. you, you know, you don't leave your salad outside in the sunshine till it wilts and then bring it in and put it in the sink. You know, it's, it, it gives them a sort of a, a bit more of a respect. And I think, you know, the same goes for me. I mean, if, if you if you have taken your time, I mean, anybody that's been deer stalking, hmm. anybody will know that if you shoot a deer, <laughs> you're going to use every single inch of that animal because uh-huh. it's one of the most exhilarating and frustrating things you'll ever do. Yeah, I bet, because mm. the size of them and stuff oh, and the, and the patience. Wait hours and hours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I, I sat in a hide two weeks ago. So I had I had uh, my head chef from... from um, uh, Brockenhurst. I had my regional head chef and uh, one of my sous chefs. We all went out with with our with our uh, venison, our, our deer stalker Jim, 
and um and, and out of all of us I was the only one that didn't shoot a deer I mean I've <laughs> shot a deer before so it's fine but these guys hadn't but out of everybody you know they all shot a deer one of them got a muntjac and the other two got a fallow each how does the oh, etiquette man. work in that situation are you together and then do you take if there's a deer do you decide who <coughs> no so 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 within, within, deer stalking, <laughs> within deer stalking it's very different I mean the yeah. etiquette within 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 bird shooting is you're obviously pegged out you're in a line yeah you know you, you have your 10 till 2 and you only get what comes into your sort of yeah you know that imaginary uh, that imaginary line because otherwise you're crossing over people's lines but within deer stalking you're you're sent to different locations on the estate because oh, okay. you're using different you know bullets i mean you know within a shotgun cartridge you have obviously you've got your ignition you've got your uh, wad which is what pushes the the pellets out and then you've got depending on the size of the pellet between sort of i don't know 25 to 30 pellets which will then you know cause a pattern which would then hit the bird and bring it down whereas you know when you're deer stalking you've literally got a, a bullet the sniper the sniper that's right yeah 308 or 645 millimeter creed or whatever it is and this is a big old beast that if you do not have the right trajectory of oh, that see, bullet that scares then you're me i'll get it wrong and just and that's it, you know, but that's why it's so, so frustrating is you can't get it wrong yeah. so so for example when we were out stalking the other week we spent ages sitting in this hide and nothing was happening well actually it was i, I was looking down my scope and i could see two fallow about 200 yards it was far too far i couldn't mm. take the shot yeah and um and so we we came out the hide and we started walking around the estate and and have you ever heard of monk jack yeah so it's like, oh, 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 oh. It's really? like dogs, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, oh. And, and you walk past, and you'd be like, jeez, there's a dog in there. And like, no, no, it's a monk jack. Oh, 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 like this. Okay, so, so anyway, so you hear it rustling around, and you know, it runs off. And then we, we come around this corner, and, and as we come around the corner, the, the, the guy who I'm with, the, the, you know, the qualified deer stalker, he stands there, and he looks out, and he goes, can I swear? Of course you can, yeah. He goes, Jesus he Christ. Goes, <laughs> and I go what he goes that <laughs> and we look out in the middle of the field and there's two stags with oh. about five to eight beautiful does behind all stood there on the horizon oh, just wow. looking at us like this uh-huh. and we're like oh and they went bosh gone oh, <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> oh, so, so they smell you before you even see them ah. Oh so God. so so because because we didn't thought, there's no way they'd all be stood in the middle of the field yeah. and literally as we came around the corner they were just right there what we've been waiting <laughs> for the whole time <laughs> and they literally just went boh and they were gone wow. and that was it we just thought that's it we're done God, that, wow. but it's that sort of elusive nature that makes it yeah sort of like so yeah yeah rewarding yeah, almost exactly. like yeah incredible but, you know. so through through that through them butchering it appreciating it wanting to use every morsel of it. Are there any cuts or bits of meats that you actually, maybe the more underrated parts of the animals that you have come across that you think, actually, do you know what? These bits don't get used enough. Or because well, shoulder and haunch is always uh, overlooked. Uh, you know, yeah. It's always the loin, isn't it? And the why why is saddle that? And loin a lot. What did the, the saddle loin, the loin, yeah. it's so much easier to cook. It's, it's lean, you take the sinew off the top, you just pan fry it. It's, it's easy. It's, it's the premium one. Mm-hmm. Um, if you just if you just take off the haunch and just cut through it, it's almost like a rump steak. You get yeah. so many different muscles, all the fibres go in different ways, it'd be tough. But if you seam bone it out, yeah. like take the muscles out and use the individual muscles, it's mm. a beautiful piece of meat. But it takes a lot more skill than cooking them, preparing the saddle. And it's only because of that that they're not as popular for places because it's just more time to prep. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, and the, old, the traditional fine dining, it, you know, the saddle, it, it's uniform, consistent, yeah. and oh, stuff. It's such and a shallow lovely. thought, though, isn't it? That? Yeah, we use both. I used to get a lot of haunch in for tartar and I'd seam mm. bone it all out yeah. break it all down and with tartar and it was beautiful tartar yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. like normally you wouldn't see that because people wouldn't take that time to seam bone and take all the sinew out between yeah. each one mm-hmm. but no it's lovely yeah yeah, ben- yeah we used to vegetable and haunch we used to do with celeriac and crab apple which was really good oh. but the, um, the, the the biggest thing that I find is that when you when you go on shoots usually they'll do you a hot meal at the end of the day oh, yeah. so if you've been stood out in the field you know waiting for these birds to come over and you're toes are like frozen yeah. solid at the end of the day you get you get back to the hunt lodge and, and they go here's a bowl or something like oh, thank god yeah, yeah so so what they tend to do is back in the day they always used to give you pheasant you'd be like not again 
Imagine they're going to see it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, anyone else? <laughs> and and, and what, what they used to do now is they serve you braised haunch or, you know, like uh, um, yeah. a stewed haunch of venison. Mm. And, and that, you know, for me, like big chunks of carrot in it, oh, lovely really. big, you know, oh, onions. And, but and sometimes and they're the best bits in the yeah, stew, isn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Soak up all the flavour so, and yeah. carrot and stuff. So, yeah. so that, that for me is the best, you know, when, yeah. when you get like a bowl of that and a nice big bit of bread. and Love it. Nah. We've that's, got, that's all part do of you, it. Just because I've spoken to loads of different people at Deerstock and it's like quite divided. Do you head shoot or heart shoot? So the, the rule of thumb is that it depends, one, how confident you are, two, okay. how far away you are. you've got to be sharp to head shoot, yeah. you've got to be good. So if, if, you are, if you're over 100 yards away, you should never attempt to head shot. Okay. Because if you take his chin off... Yeah, and then it yeah. runs off. And, and, and also, if, if you... And because they're still, if they move the head they're, they're not moving there exactly is that so, right yeah, yeah. so, so I, I belong to a, a, a gun club called the tunnel down mm. in, in West Dorset so so I shoot on the 100 metre range down there I shoot on the 35 metre range I'm I'm always down there with my 308 or, or any of my rifles practising because you know it's one thing being able to go down to a target shoot and, and yeah. sit there put your target out and go <laughs> blah 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 but when you're in a field and, and you're dealing with an animal that if it moves at the wrong second and you hit it. Say, say you're say you're going for the head, mm. and you, you it moves. You get it in the back of the neck. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then that's running, and you've got a wounded animal. If you go if you go for the heart, then even if it moves, you're still going to get it through the. Ri- you know, you're still going to get it in a place where it's not. It's gonna probably kill, not like, going to go too oh, far before okay. it goes down. So 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 what they say is, you know, if if you're if you're not really that experienced, you should always go for a heart shot. But obviously, if you do go for a heart shot, you're going to lose. You know more meat. So from of a course. chef's point of view, we yeah. always want a headshot. I'm, stre- want... I'm stressed just thinking. We, we, about <laughs> it. Yeah. So we, we, yeah. we very interesting. But you know, yeah, for, yeah. For, for me, if say for example, I was in a hide at 50, 50 yards or fifty meters, even probably, yeah, and and it came out right in front of me, and I was sitting there, I'd go for that. Uh, okay. But if if I wasn't, I would always go for yeah. Uh-huh. Um, when the, uh, we've got so much ground to cover, I want to make sure we get it through. But one of the last uh, sort of questions that I had on on this subject was: um, Are there any, c- not necessarily cuts, but even animals that you don't believe are getting enough attention, or we should be bringing onto menus more often in in, in the whole c- in this country? Are there any munjack? Yeah, munjack's massive. Yeah. I mean, I remember talking. There's no season for munjack. Is there there isn't. It's all year round. round. Oh, that's a great point. It's all year yeah. round, and it's one of the biggest <laughs> menaces yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Um, there were I, so many when I lived in Suffolk. Just everywhere. Well, that's it. I think but, uh, that's a bit of a misunderstood thing about deer and munjack, isn't it? About how they like they would breed like rabbits if they weren't properly. Is that right? Like they'd yeah. be a yeah. Yeah. Not, no, it'd be a nightmare. They, they would There's run no, rabbits. They do. So, 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 so yeah, yeah, during lockdown, yeah, deer have no natural predator. So throughout lockdown. They multiplied so much that now we are in a real problem. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. And well, then they can devastate the environment. Today, yeah. I saw five on the side of the road. Mudrax. That's mm. crazy. I had no idea that. Because, yeah, and it's a real threat. Because, like, 80% uh, of deer meat goes to the restaurant industry. Right. Restaurants were closed. Of course. So it yeah. just wasn't going it's anywhere. Obvious, yeah. So they're just multiplying and multiplying no yep. predator they've kind of destroyed right. a natural yeah. environment like, so yeah. muntjac yeah. and deer get them on the menu muntjac so. things go on I mean I used to love rabbit mm. but um, a lot of the rabbits that we get now um, you know they suffer quite badly from mixed mitosis so we can't use them much anymore right. I, I, I love, heard I love, that for a while mixed mitosis yeah, yeah it comes in the new forest in Hampshire Dorset where it comes out quite bad oh, especially when you get that loads of rain then it gets really hot and then loads of rain oh, okay. you see a lot of uh, rabbits sort of wandering around <laughs> <laughs> um, the, oh, uh, yeah. the hair I love hair I love hair it's yeah. something I've that ever you don't see a lot of I, my, my wife has a, has a meat business in Cranbourne um, called From Salt to Smoke and um, <laughs> she, uh, she, she actually the, the Lord Lord Cranbourne shoots a lot of hair and when they get them um, uh, we, we get those at home they are I love it, it it's, it's, I, I'm not a massive fan of rabbit I sometimes find it a bit too kind of near when you compare but, the two hair wins yeah, every yeah. day exactly yeah. if you're going to eat Something like a rabbit, you're going to eat a hair. Mm-hmm. And um, I say a funny story about a hair. If you want. Go on, yeah. 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 So, so I when when, when uh, I first met um, when I first saw it, I was introduced to the Crown Board Estate. I went up to meet the, the our next door neighbour, our next door neighbour who was making cheese. His name's Peter from Book and Bucket Cheese Company, and he makes the most incredible cheese. So I drove down there to see him, <clears throat> and as I was driving down the, um, the 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 lane there, this hair literally jumped out in front of me, and I hit it with my truck. Wow. 
and, and <clears throat> I looked in my rear view mirror and it's running up the road behind me. So the guy who we were with, um, we got to the place and he said, um, I said, do you see that? I hit that hair. He goes, yeah, he said, it'd be dead on the road when, when we go back up. He said, it's just sort of, you know, it's just nervous twitching. Mm. I said, okay, fine. I said, can I have it? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, we'll pick it up. So anyway, so we did the cheese tour and all that sort of stuff. I ate far too much cheese as I always do when I go to some <laughs> decent visits. And, um, and, and so, so we got back in the car. Sure enough, it was there laid up on the side of the road. So I pulled over, I put it in the back and I went home. And it was back when we, you know, we had all those winds and, and we lost like loads of trees and loads of trees and loads of fences anyway. So I got home, we had this garage in the back garden and I strung it up in my garage and we had a next door neighbour who was a bit of a, <laughs> bit of an idiot. And, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he, he basically, his, his fence had fallen down in the winds, right? But for whatever reason, he got mixed up and thought it was our fence. So anyway, so right. he comes strolling into my garden unannounced. Excuse me, mate. We talk about your fence, yeah, because your fence's gone down, and and you know I'm not paying for get this sorted. You've got to get it sorted. I'm like, listen, mate, it's your fence. Don't be an idiot. And I opened up the door, and there's this hair right hanging yeah, from 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 the thing. I said, no, carry on talking, mate. You're coming in, and, and, and I start opening up this oh, no hair. Way. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, <laughs> and I've already bled it out, so I've chopped its arms. Like the oh. severed at the wrist and I bled out overnight because and the cuts broke so that I had the blood because I wanted to do jugs hair so you obviously oh, nice. thick and so so it was cold yeah so so anyway so so he's standing there oh looking at me God. like over it and he goes no no <laughs> no <laughs> actually um, no no we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. you you say busy so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it another day I said no you carry on come on mate we're going to talk about it now we've got to sort this out I said by the way it's your fence right? <laughs> and you need to get it sorted out because I've got kids in here right and he's like yeah yeah I'll get it sorted out <laughs> yes, and he sir. left oh, right and I thought brilliant but that sums it up that is all brilliant. I'm doing is, is prepping my dinner I know I know that is incredible <laughs> I absolutely love that great note to, uh, to end that topic on um, mm. want to squeeze in a little bit of chat about uh, judging competitions because uh, we've talked about it a little bit over previous podcasts because a lot of our chefs have obviously judged competitions. Um, I believe you are you've been a judge at the Taste, the Great Taste Awards. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, yeah, I'm Golden Fork judge at the Great Taste Awards. Fantastic. And I'm also a World Cheese. Oh, yeah, lovely. oh yeah, I remember you saying about that. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. lovely. Yeah. That my is my worst nightmare. That yeah, job. not a big yeah. cheese guy. Don't eat cheese. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I get that look up. Yeah. 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 I'm used to it now, 39 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah. my first question on this, I guess, for both of you, because I know you judge stuff as well. Like, yeah. what are you actually, when you're going into it, are you actually thinking about it any more than when you just go to a restaurant to enjoy food? Are you like, you know, are you trying to uh, dissect things on your tongue, like making sure you're not drinking coffee and stuff in the day to get your pet? Like, are you, do you take it like, do you have to do that sort of stuff? Well, or for me, really? for me, when I when I do it, I mean, like, the thing is, because it's because it's blind tasting, you don't know who it is, you don't know where it's come from, any of that. So you just have to take it on face value. Yeah. I mean, you kind of have to hope that you haven't been really ill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a heavy <laughs> night the night before. I mean, you know, you have to be relatively sensible. Of course, but, um, yeah. You know, I, I, it's a weird one because with the Great Taste Awards, because I mean, I'm so busy that I tend to only. Yeah, quite rudely I tend to only do that final judging thing if I if, you know when I get invited which I'm honoured to be mm -hmm. but it's um it, it's one of those things where by the time it gets to me you know it's gone through so many different palettes so it's had uh, to go okay. from from zero to one star one star to two star two star to three star three star to us mm -hmm. and you know that you know bearing in mind there's so many different people that have mm -hmm. tried that product over and over and over again before it gets to us you have to one realize that that is it's obviously great because it wouldn't be there if it wasn't but at the same time you know it, it's a matter of opinion i mean you know some some products split the room i mean i had one of, yeah i have one of the best i mean i am an anchovy man i come yeah. from italian descent yeah of course yeah, you, you know yeah. and it, we'll talk about gout in a minute but anyway <laughs> I, 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 i've been cursed <laughs> i've been cursed by the anchovy god but sure. anyway so, so, so anchovies are something that i love it's something i've grown up with one of my earliest memories of food is eating anchovies with my nonna in the back of the car after wow, she's just brilliant. landed from italy you know That's and, insane and um and, and this anchovy split the room it was me i remember it was me drew baker jose pizzario who else was there xanthi clay Anyway, we're all in this room and we all love the anchovy and everybody else was a bit, mm, oh, I don't know. So you've got to, you know, you hold up the cards mm. and we're all there, five, five, you know, whatever, it's top marks. And, um, and it really split the room. I think in the end, I think it won. 
Really? Oh, wow. I think it did. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. He actually won it. But it was a real kind of like... Really divisive. Um, yeah, yeah, really divisive. But, uh, do, do, you feel, but do you taste the food in front of the people that cooked it? No. Oh, uh, oh yeah, in front of the people that cooked it, but not yeah. the people that produced it. It's not about the people that cooked it. It's about the people who produce it. Oh, it's about the producer. right. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So what do you, yeah, what, is it like just a fun day because it just sounds fun or is it a bit stressful because there's a lot on the line with it? Like, I mean, it, it depends on if you like that. I mean, I love that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you do a lot of pieces to camera, you do a lot of kind of, you know, there's a lot of filming involved, a lot of, you know, asking your opinion, which yeah. I really, really love. Uh-huh. Um, I, think, I think most people that get invited to that day are usually people that are quite good chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, uh, but yeah, it, you know, at that point, it's really good. I mean, I'm actually trying to get my kids involved in the whole thing mm. ah, because nice. they're trying to get more young people involved because it's becoming quite a sort of, you know, slightly older palette, which is mm. fine. But, you know, if we look back now at the, the different sort of food trends that are coming through and all the rest of it, you know, um, uh, it, it's Torsi and uh, Jay Fran that, that run the, the, the awards and, and all the rest of it. So, mm. you know, I was chatting to them um, when we were in Spain and... Um, and yeah, they're looking at you know getting more young people involved. I think it's really yeah, good. That yeah, that's what we need now. Yeah. We need more, you know, those young definitely, people coming through. Yeah, mm-hmm. Definitely, younger palettes. Obviously, like those, these competitions are massive because they act as a big marketing tool or like a leg up for people in the industry to like move on because they're real badges of honor, aren't yeah, they? Especially so great taste like, awards. Like you, yeah. people recognise that badge, whether it's cheese, charcuterie, whatever it is. People recognise that badge straight away. Don't sure. they? It's, you know, as a producer, I'm sure. They're Proud yep. to put it on their um, put it on their product. Do you enjoy yeah. judging food competitions? I do. Yeah, I've only ever judged chef competitions, yeah. Um, but yeah, I do. It's it's nice because I because I've done loads of chef competitions yeah, as a youngster, shoes, yeah. so I know how they're feeling. And I remember judging. I mean, some of the judges were sorry when I was cooking. Some of the judges were so old school, <laughs> dismissive. Yeah, um, <laughs> they wouldn't ever appreciate anything new that you're trying to do. Not wacky, but you know, things moving on. It was just this this stubbornness. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I always vowed that if I was ever a judge that I would have more of an open yeah, mind and just trying to appreciate what they're trying to do as long as it's, you know, technically well done, executed, season mm. well. You know, I know I really enjoy it and it's great when you see, you know, young chef do something really well and just how they buzz from it. Yeah, and yeah. you give them that feedback. Yeah. You know, I've judged oh, sure. they're really proud judged the national chef of the year up to the semi-final stage generally don't mm-hmm. let me do the finals <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting yeah really pr- proud to have done that um, and then l- local competitions as well the uh, British Culinary Federation Young Chef of the Year did that with Glyn recently oh, done it nice. a couple of times and it's nice I really like the Young Chef ones because yeah. yeah. they, they get a lot more out of it and I really encourage any <clears> Young <throat> Chef to try and do it because it's so good for your confidence and networking you know it's not all about winning it it's about going in there mm. and yeah we're all competitive and you want to win of course but you learn so much from it and you mm-hmm. get so much from it and you meet guys you know you yeah. wouldn't necessarily bump yeah. into yeah. and getting the feedback no uh, yeah I, I do i think it's a, i think it's a really positive thing what well, like the what's like the advice you give to people that are entering those competitions or are there like common mistakes that keep almost oh, happening God, at yeah. those sorts of things it's amazing you think? you'd probably see so amazing people who don't fucking season Really? Like, yeah, like just because they've forgotten because they're nervous. I think or... maybe, yeah, a bit really? nervous, a bit forgetful, or they're just like not tasting their own food. Right. And you know, any competition I'm doing, if you, you know, if it's good produce, you execute it well and it's seasoned well, you're going to be in with a good chance mm-hmm. of winning. Really, you know, all the the faff yeah, comes yeah. after, and that's extra points afterwards. It's like that's mm-hmm. that's what you focus on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I, I obviously judged that um, uh, young chef of the year. With um, uh, Paul Lainsworth and all that. Um, ah, yes, yeah, the last year, one, yeah. Yeah, with um, Jockey and all those guys. And one day, it, it was. It was oh, no, I, but I, just to find a young chef, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it was. It was the first year that I'd ever done it because I, I always do. Um, so I'm heavily involved with the Royal Academy of Culinary Arts. So I do a lot of stuff with, you know, um, Animals of Excellence and and um, and all that sort of stuff. So it's the first year I've done it, and it was a complete eye opener for me. Mm. And it was an incredible event, and and I and I loved it, but. Going back to what you were saying about that, you know, every year I judge the specialised chef course, which is something that I was, I was a spec chef, and it's something that, you know, as a young person, it, it's a course that you can come on to and you're chosen out of however many hundred people apply and you're put into these incredible places in London <laughs> and all around the sort of country to, to, to train for, back in my day, it was four years, but now I think it's three years with, with the guys that I take on. But, you know, these, these kids that, you, you know, you have... 
that you that you you've come down to you know to judge. So they hold the um, uh, the final exam at Bournemouth and Paul College. It's a big old day, six hours worth of cooking. Wow. But but going back to what you were saying, you know, I, I've been stood in a room where it's me, Adam Byatt. John Williams, yeah. you know, like like there's a group of chefs, uh, Martin Nail, you yeah. know, we've all stood there, and um and 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 we'd be like, right, I can't wait for this. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's like I'm starving, you know, I'm so hungry, and it come out, and bear in mind these these kids have cooked in some of the best restaurants and hotels, arguably in the country, you know, yeah. the Ritz, blah 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 blah, blah. and they come out and they go. Oh, that looks raw. Oh, no, yeah. it's like, really? Oh, that doesn't look seasoned. Oh, no. like, yeah. I was just like, God damn it, like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> That's you, not you, why you, I'm you, here. No, exactly. You're feeling so sorry for it. But, but, you know, usually it turns out okay, like nine turns out of ten. And bearing in mind, it's not a competition at the level that we're talking about. This is an exam for their, mm. you know, something that they've been, their, their mm. diploma that they've been working for. Sure, for, yeah. So, so, you know, not all of them, by the way. It's only no, one of course. Two, but, yeah, but, you yeah. know, it's... The pressure it, gets it, to people. It, it is. It's yeah. the pressure. And if you think about that on an exam, you know, put that into a competition mm. where, you know, yes, okay, this is an exam, but within a competition, you know, you're there with your peers and you're there, you know, in front of, you know, some of the best chefs oh, in the country. Yeah, it's it's, it's crazy pressure. It's mm. like, and um, you know, you just think, no wonder you forgot the salt. I mean, you're lucky you remembered to put yeah. your pants on that morning. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, oh, no, because some, some yeah. of the lineup judges. I remember one of the first ones. I was like honoured to judge. It was um, it was the semi final of the National Chef of the Year, and it was up in Sheffield, and like judging it was like Mark Sargent, Phil Howard, um, Sat Baines. Um, and a few of the guys of that, and I, you know, I was at Tunnel Mill, I was probably, what, 30, worked in stuff, I'd worked in good places, but never, I'd been a head chef a couple of years, never yeah, yeah. achieved anything of my own. Mm, yeah. I, was just, I felt like a fraud. But, and I <laughs> yeah. genuinely Imposter, did. Like, Imposter syndrome, isn't it? That's what yeah, it is. Yeah, so I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why, why am I here? Yeah. Like, <laughs> genuinely did, but, yeah. like, the sta- there was about 12 chefs, like, free course meal, and three or four, like, real standout ones, and some that were just, like, really really bad and like yeah. one guy served his dessert first and like you just no, you serve <laughs> it like you're in a restaurant you serve start to main course, dessert yeah. and I remember I stood there with Phil Howard and like we were waiting for this dish to come out and he was late anyway yeah. and we were like that looks like chocolate that? <laughs> <laughs> that's his dessert and Phil was fuming really? like absolutely oh, fuming he's like you just, just don't do that I remember I, I drove back down on the way after and I phoned, <laughs> phoned sat and I was like like talking about some of the things and he was like well if you're going to slag it I'll fucking enter it next year <laughs> <laughs> so I did and I came second I didn't oh, win it uh, yeah, in the final yeah, but yeah that's good <laughs> that's amazing oh mate amazing okay right let's uh, let's go to a couple of questions that we got through from my Instagram and Twitter pages got one here from Chef Watts on Instagram who says what's one thing that has permanently changed for you since lockdowns and that could be work or home so good, good question Anything that in work or at home that's changed uh, permanently? Because at work, stuff has. We've streamlined the business a bit more. We only open four days a week now, which is great. <laughs> yeah, I dream. Fucking great. Fortunately, the business still works. Like, and it's still going. Because <laughs> that was obviously the concern. Like, yeah. I'm going to pay. Um, no, and it's, to be honest, it works better. The business model is better. And that's because of lockdown. You um, I, it was always in my mind to do. But sure. But it, it was like a... Yeah. Forced it and I would like, took the risk, like, let's have a go. Mm-hmm. And I, it was only, used to be open like Wednesday to Saturday lunch, dinner. And then mm-hmm. Sunday lunch. Sunday lunch wasn't a great revenue spinner for us anyway. So mm-hmm. I knocked that on the head. So everyone got three days off solid. Right. And even like, you know, the, you know, if we're short staff, no one's going to call in because we're closed. So... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's changed, and then yeah, the working hours are a bit better for the guys. Um, yeah, the menus more streamlined. So in that, it's, it, there's a lot of positives. So we don't it, take tables for, after half eight now, because right. like, it's taste the menu only. Yeah, at dinner. yeah of course. So gonna be in for a long the, time. The, the night, the like, the night was late. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, just those those little things that sort of forced decisions. Yeah, it's not, and it has it's been it a refreshing thing in some ways. Yeah, in a better way. It's sort of yeah. forced change, like you say. It's forced change, and that's not been a bad thing because we've had to sort of adjust, but. For yeah. the better in some ways. Better staff retention as well, I'm sure now. That's, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Like like two of my guys. So Laura, um, the girl who's on the front tonight, she's my head chef. She's been yeah. here five years and and Gibbo as well, the big lad there, he, he's been here since just day one as well. And yeah. they, they probably wouldn't have stayed if we'd had that Sunday, because the Sunday shift was horrible. Mm. 
there was only us three in the kitchen for a couple of years and it was, it was yeah, pretty savage grind, times yeah. and now yeah. you know we're much more rounded but personally yeah just more time for myself like yeah, yeah right. I just do I just take but like, I just thought my life less nice like yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't need to be here so I'll go home and just be on my own yeah nice but yeah loads of loads of me time it's yeah. great yeah, yeah. Great. just go home on my own and just yeah listen to music and <laughs> drink whiskey <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Pretty much. What, what about you, James? Is there any um, uh, any big changes because of lockdowns? Yeah, I had a baby. Not wow. personally, my wow. wife. But, and that was because uh, of lockdown. Ju- just <laughs> before <laughs> lockdown, oh, we right. had a. Um, uh, yeah. Well, apart from that, um, oh, was we, that an, was that intense then being on a full lockdown with a newborn, or was that to nah, make it easier? So easy. Yeah. Honestly, with with third baby in, we've got two oh, teenagers. Oh, piece we of piss now. Off to, yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was pretty tough. <laughs> but, um, but but uh, we well you know what you know what changed me is what I when, when we locked down I bought a Komodo barbecue right? right it wasn't like a big green egg or anything like that it was literally one of these Japanese black things that was sent over from from wherever it came from mm. and I put it in the back garden and that was what kept me going in in lockdown I just oh, really? really but I uh, so so after after I um, worked in New York I went out to live in Arizona where my wife's from. And um, I got really into like my curing and smoking and air drying and wow. barbecuing. And, and it was something that I'd really forgotten about for, mm. for so many years because I've been so focused on my British sustainable <laughs> foraging, yeah. you know, yeah, like shit, that all, model, all that sort yeah. of thing that, that I just really kind of forgot about that side of, of life. And I bought this um, this Komodo grill and that's all I did, man. I just, really? I just bought the best meat I could get during lockdown and I just did slow and low. I did... You know Nando's wow. every other night. I did, you oh, know, nice. or, and, and and it just. Wow. I, I did what a dad! Little, Imagine this guy. Little, <laughs> you're 16. You're like, what's the? Oh, he's just doing Nando's outside. What's your dad doing? Oh, fuck. Oh, yeah, but they still go. Mm, so <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. You can't yeah. win, can you? <laughs> Stab you in the face with that bone. No, no, I wouldn't. I would never do that. <laughs> but it's, but you know, it, it, yeah, and I think that's what I, I just really enjoyed it, you know, and, and I and I had great fun and. I, I reconnected with like Sam and Shauna and DJ Barbecue, you know, we'd, oh, we'd party wow. together at the Abergavenny Food Festival oh, that's cool. like a couple of years before and yeah, it was just, you know, it sort of kept me going, that's what kept me going during lockdown and then when, when we did lockdown, obviously, you know, things don't stop because of lockdown at work, so we did um, Hey, weeks. well you could tell work that technically you were upskilling. By doing your barbecue, you I'll down. phone you next time. Yeah. <laughs> if ever this happens again, <laughs> you can write me a letter. But no, it's, no I mean, it's, you know, I think you know when you're in a certain, you know, it's when it's when it's part of your life. It's 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 uh, anyway. So we did two weeks at the pig, and two weeks at home, which was quite fun for the kids. I mean, imagine wow. living two weeks at the pig wow. every every other, you yeah. know. So so once a month you go and spend two weeks, and oh. they were there doing their work. Dad nice. was just going down the garden, okay, so go down the garden, they'd wow. pick their dinner, oh, we'd then be in the kitchen, we'd all what be cooking life. together. And that's, so, that's beautiful. I stayed there recently and it's fucking it's stunning. Yeah, you yeah, loved it. Absolutely yeah, lovely. Which room were they in? Uh, well, we, we, weren't, we weren't in Burt's box. We, we were in the stables. You know, uh, you know yes. yeah, yeah, so, nice. so as you look at the stables, the stables. As, as, as you look at the stables, we were in the we had the whole top floor there. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. When Heston came, we had the room beneath us. Oh <laughs> nice. <laughs> Too small for us. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, weirdly that you brought up Heston, because our next question comes from David, who says, who would win in a fight, Heston or Gordon? Now, Go do on. you know who would win, Paul? It's, it's an easy one. Well, the, the, everyone would go for Gordon, but, but I know um, Heston has some kind of history, but so, I only know a little bit about so, it. So Heston used to be a kickboxer? Yes, that was oh, it. That was it. But interesting. the last time I saw Heston, right, he just had an operation... And I said, what have you done to your hip? He said, I've had an operation because I've spent all my, year, all my life kickboxing <laughs> and I've messed up my hip really? and I've had to have a, an operation on my hip because, oh, like, because he apparently broke, he broke some part of his mm. foot when he was kickboxing yeah. and he, he, he was thrown off by something like a quarter of an inch. He spent his whole life ah. walking funny and it wore away his hip. So when I saw him at a Royal Academy event, he stood up and he did this big old speech and he was on crutches. 
no and obviously way. me being me, I had a couple. I was like, "Hi, <laughs> what have you done to that?" <laughs> and he told me all about. It. So, oh, that's oh, but yeah. so he's got the experience, but he's got a sort of a long-lasting injury. Yeah. The, the one thing, not that I uh, care if about this question. Still have his like that's a, he can have that tool. <laughs> if he could turn him into nunchucks. Yeah. Well, this is actually this is a big thing. He's a lot shorter. Gordon. He is. Yes, I, I, I reckon Gordon would be. Yeah, I mean the, the, I know that, that aggression's still in there, isn't it? In yeah. a way, oh he's, god, he, yeah. Have you seen his new TV he, show? Yeah. Yeah. And he's fit. He's always yeah, been yeah. fit. He, isn't he? Yeah. You'd knock him down and get up again. I think. Yeah. yeah. Every time it'd be like Apollo. Yeah. Everyone looks. Fit. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone looks fit if your t-shirts are that tight, though, right? I yeah. mean, they are ridiculous. <laughs> this is insane. Okay, I think I think probably I'm getting Gordon. Yeah, I think I just, think, I think, uh, I think just the rage. I think it's the it's extra element of rage. Oh, I we, need, we need we need them to have a white collar boxing match. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just yeah. to settle the question. <laughs> uh, cool. Last one here from Will, who says, uh, "What dirty food do you love to eat at home, but think you'd get judged for for omitting it?" Uh, well, you Too know many. Me, oh, it's yours. Your yeah. super noodle sandwich. super noodle sandwiches. Super noodle sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've like, spoken about it on the pod before. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> when was the last time you had a super? I noodle? haven't for it. I don't have them at the at the house a long time. I might get some actually. Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 my I don't have them. Uh, addicted to kabuto noodles around those. Oh I've yeah, those, yeah. yeah. No, I like, what yeah, I like I about them. super noodles I, I is they they, yeah. they turn to like mush. They're so yeah, yeah. soft. Yeah. So, it's so, so, so grim. <laughs> what you mash them into a bit of toast for the fork. Right? It's got to be. It's got to be um, on bread. <laughs> but you can't. You can't, don't make a sandwich with two. But it's got to be like a fold bread. You fold it so it keeps a pre sandwich. <laughs> yeah. So butter. Well, it's like a it, fold. Taco, it. like a taco. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a taco. Like a loose taco. Rabio. <laughs> yeah. It's a council house taco. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you a funny story hey, about that? About, could be a food truck in Camden, <laughs> and yeah. you'd get away with that. You'd get away with that. I'm telling Good. you. So, so, so my son. Okay. He doesn't. He doesn't taste chili. So I, I was the parent that when you used to go to Nando's when, when you were a very young parent, you're like, oh, thank God, we just need to be out from the house. <laughs> we'll have a bit of chicken. He was the one that the, the waiters were taking pictures of having the triple X sauce oh, on his, wow. you know, yeah. like four years old. They're like, oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> four year old, is it like triple X sauce? And so he's gone on. I, my, my wife puts it down to the fact that when he was born, he was born in Arizona. And she used to eat all this like oh, crazy spice. Okay, like, there could be something in that. Although she also doesn't really seem to react to spice like I do. So I think yeah. it's just a genetic thing. So anyway, so um, we, we bought these, um, these noodles. Okay, mm. which are the Korean ones. Do you ever the Korean ones? No, no, I don't think oh, so. Oh, my Lord. All I would say it's is that it fire. comes with a little sachet, yeah, that says chilli sauce. <laughs> it's not. It's pure volcanic. So as somebody who eats, like, you know, who's had, like, super noodles, you think, oh, you just put it all in. You just <laughs> yeah, 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 of course yeah, you, you would. Yeah. Yeah. That's made to measure. That's yeah, right. yeah. It's, <laughs> it's there. You put the hot water into the line and you put it all in. So anyway, so so I we, we each had this bowl. So I'd been to the the Chinese um, supermarket in Chinatown in London. I bought some of these for my son because he loves them. And they come back. And we both sat there, put them down. And I said, right, there's yours, mate. Put it all in. So he put it all in. We sat there, and literally, I took a mouthful. Like, <laughs> it was so hot I could feel you know when you spit something out and it splatters on oh, your face yeah. I could feel it like burning and he's looking again what are you doing really so, and he's just sitting there eating it that's mental and I'm like are you crazy oh. so the next week we went to a Thai festival yeah and I entered into a chili. I entered a chili eating competition. <laughs> yeah, yeah How I did. did. You? And he won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he won a <laughs> case of Chang beer. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he's up on the stage. How old is he, Tom? 14? 14. Won yeah, a case no, of now I beer. won the beer. Yeah. <laughs> well done, son. So, so anyway, so he's on the stage. There's literally like 10 people up there from like little old Thai ladies. So, you know, these big old blokes and, you know, builders. You're gonna yeah, I like it. Yeah, literally, yeah. honestly. And, 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 it, and he's like this. And they had to, what was it called? It was like na- Napa salad. You know, basically it's like a load of um, shredded salad with about a handful of Chili bird's eye cooked. chilies on top of I mean, it. It's insane. Oh, God. Yeah. And, and I saw these chilies going up on stage before. <laughs> oh, 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 is this child abuse? Is this worth the 24 pack of I don't know if it's child abuse or not. Do I want the beer? Yeah, I kind of want the beer. <laughs> anyway, so he goes up on stage. He's like this. Ate the whole lot, 
literally. No just, way. Like I bet they couldn't nothing. believe it. On stage, believe could they? And he had no reaction. No, no like nothing. He's just like, yeah, great. It's like a. Wow. It's Sometimes like a... I listen late at night for when he goes to Lou just to think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> surely. That, he's does he feel it at the other end? Right. No, nope, sure nothing. I mean, really? Honestly, it's, it's, it's like a wow, weird it's superpower. It's yeah, like, <laughs> it's like, it's like <laughs> the weirdest superpower it's in the world. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, God, amazing. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, no, so my Chinese takeaway. Oh, we, I, I, I love. Nothing dirty I, about that. Well, is there? <laughs> really, from a chef's point of view, <laughs> quite a suit, 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 suit. Suit. <laughs> depends where you get a it. Cheap slice white. No, yeah, no, de- depends. <laughs> uh, dep- depends where you get it from. Exactly. Right. That's. So I only get it from the best dirty or not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what's, your, what's your go-to Chinese like? Uh, Dragon Palace, Barrett Road, Christchurch. What's your go-to <laughs> dishes? Uh, I have Peking spare ribs. Yeah. Um, I used to have chicken and cashew nuts or crispy shredded beef and uh, mm-hmm. special fried rice. Yeah. Ca- chicken cashew nuts all day long. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, I love yeah, chicken. The, oh, so good. I could do that now. Uh, I could, okay. I've eaten my weight. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's, uh, let's do boiling point, shall we? This is one of my favourite bits. This is where okay. our two chefs tell of the real heat of the kitchen. When have you lost your shit or someone's lost your shit on you? Uh, who wants to go first? Any, any do, you want, do you want me to go first? Yeah. Go yeah. It, do you, want, do you want me to get you some more wine? Yeah, why not? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, this is uh, this is about a customer, and as as you know, if you anyone who listens to a lot of these podcasts, sure. I have a lot of issues with customers because I just <laughs> I don't <laughs> suffer fools. I do not suffer fools at all, and I just I, I like zero tolerance for idiots <laughs> or assholes and arrogant customers. Just we're not that kind of place. You can't yeah, play yeah. up like that. So when what was it? Um, it was a few weeks back. We had. Um, Laura was off. Um, I think she was on a hendo, a friend's hendo or something. So she had the Friday and Saturday off. So I was on the, the meat and fish. And like, when I'm back on now, she like to get get everything out fast. Like, and the guys are like, what's <laughs> going on here? It's normally pretty chill. And I'm just like, right, bang, bang, go, go, go. And um, like, we don't, we stop, uh, we don't take tables after half eight now. After like, say, an early lockdown thing. Mm. It used to be half nine. Now, last table was half eight. And you know, we'll always give grace time with customers. Customers, people are always late. It's nice if the phone, yeah, or email or something. But course, yeah, you yeah. know, some people aren't that polite, are they? Um, <laughs> and I think it was. Wait, what's it, what's an impli- So, if someone's five minutes late, is that worthy of they should have called ahead? No. So we have a rule that it's like if we don't hear anything or see them in fifteen minutes, then we call. It's too uh, early to call before that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's yeah, a bit yeah. pushy. 15 right. minutes, I think, especially if you're the last table, 15 yeah, yeah. minutes, hi, <laughs> just checking where you are, blah, blah, blah. And these were the last yeah. table, and it was quarter to nine, and then uh, phoned them, nothing. It was table four, booked in, nothing. I was like, oh, they're not going to show, are they? Fucking, I was ready to charge them. And <laughs> yeah, of course, you probably yeah. Yeah. Laptop <laughs> open. Laptop open. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 we'll send table four in a minute. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and it was table four, and we do have quite a strict cancellation policy. I mean, you see how small we are with twenty nine covers, and we don't turn, and you know people don't show. Or, and I'm really, I'm really flexible. Say if a table of four, if they contact us in a day and say, oh, look, two of them can't make it, or one of them, I wouldn't charge them. When people don't show up, and they don't, when show up and it's less, and they don't tell us, then I'll, I'll charge or put mm-hmm. on a bill because yeah. it's, it's more of a just have the fucking courtesy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they were late anyway. Like they came. So yeah, what time, what time are we talking now? After they, it was like. They just they parked over the road and sort of walk in, not strolling, yeah, <laughs> about five to nine, and it's 25 minutes. No, like, oh, sorry, we're late, and nothing. Just walked in, three of them, sat down, there's three of them. And then you, uh, obviously, you don't go, because they're late, you think one other person's running late. You don't yeah, go yeah. over and say, where's the other one? Do you yeah, think sure. we're waiting longer, <clears throat> waiting longer? And like, give them menus and doing them drinks and everything. I was like, Jack, fucking, what's going on? Come on. Come on, we've fucking like we've sent like most of the restaurant. Yeah. And he goes to us like, "Are we? Um, how long on the other person?" And like, "Oh, they're not coming." Oh, oh I was fucking fuming. And Jack come over. He told me he's like, "Don't worry, I'm going to tell him. Don't worry." <laughs> so he told he told him he's like, "Oh yeah, this." Uh, he's like, "Yeah, unfortunately, as it's not much notice, we've prepared all the food and it's last day. We we're, we're going to have to charge it was fifty five pound for that yeah, that yeah. person." Yeah. And he was just like. Yeah, that's fine. <coughs> but didn't even look at Jack. It's like, say you're Jack there, oh. and just give him that. He went, yeah, that's fine. Oh. And this is a young lad, about 25-ish, with two girls. Thought he was the boy. Oh, and he was yeah. just like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and like, waved him away. And I saw it, and I'm just, like, boiling. It's like, why do you have to be like that, you know? Uh, 
You get your gun. And then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was ready. Um, yeah, and then, so I've said to the guys, right, this is going to be a record time, this meal. I don't, I don't give a fuck. This is going quick. <laughs> Normally, people sit, table of three or four, be about three, three and a half, sometimes four hours. If wow. really yeah, that's themselves. a long time when you think about it, yeah. Yeah, this was an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> I fucking, it was like, I've got the fish in the pan. Is like, clear. Like, Pour the wine. <laughs> and clear them the fish is about two minutes off and they're like but yeah so look they finished cutting this down like boom, boom oh boom. my god just because they were so like rude and that the, like the food I would never ever like, like compromise give the them food compromise yeah. the food yeah, ever yeah, yeah. it was still just as good it was just really fast <laughs> but anyway this this arse it gets to the end gets to the bill at the end and obviously Jack's put the 55 quid on and the rest of the bill and the guy wouldn't even look at him it's probably because he got like, indigestion <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh god, I'm lit. <laughs> and um, yeah, wouldn't even look at Jack <clears throat> the bill and just gets his phone to tap. <laughs> oh, Didn't go through. Oh no! And then the guy, and then <laughs> considering he went earlier, no, yeah, no problem. <laughs> 50, Fifty-five quid, like, pfft, yeah. fuck it, hello, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then he's like, it must be your machine. It must be your machine, Jack. Um, maybe it is, but it, it's worked fine all night for the ten fucking table. But, so, so I've um, had six, sir. They don't and work. he's like, get, <laughs> <laughs> he gets the card out and just linked to it. Does the card? Card declined. It was fucking oh. beautiful. So one of the girls had to pay. <laughs> oh, no, no. Honestly, oh, I was loving it. Poor lad. Oh, like, you're buzzing. That's the you know those customers that treat you like that. They're the ones you want the card to decline <laughs> yeah. on. Isn't it? Not the nice sweet old lady no, or something. No. It's, it's them. Oh man, that is beautiful. Yeah. What a story. Love it. Okay, James. Have you I got... don't know how I can compete with that. Oh really. no, it's, yeah, it's, I'm sure you were know. you were at the Savoy for how many years? <clears throat> I've got a lot of stories from the Savoy. A lot of them come with a racing. But um, <laughs> yeah, <coughs> you don't have to name names. <laughs> <though. laughs> yeah. Actually, I think I'll tell the one. I was going to tell the one about the fish moose, but I'm going to tell the one about um, the holiday request. Okay, okay. great. So, so when I when I was um, back at the Savoy back in what year was it? So I was there from '94 to just about the middle of 99, right? And, and the Savoy is one of those places, I mean, I did my apprenticeship there, Anton Edelman was the head chef, and it was a time when London was one of those places where, as a chef, you kind of went around the houses. You went to different hotels, different restaurants that were of note to get certificates or, yeah. you know, references and all that to, Bit of to sort of build up your CV. Yeah. And, um, and the Savoy is one of those places you went there for a year. It was known as one of the toughest um, uh, kitchens in London. When I arrived there at 16, there was 136 chefs in the kitchen, which is insane. I mean, mm. I don't know how wow. many... It's unheard of now, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. So, so, you know, on, on, each, on each section, so you had the potage, the hot fish, the sauce, the veg... The, the roast, you had the hors d'oeuvre on the other side, you had the grill, you had the, the butchery, the larder, the cold fish, and then downstairs was the, was the pastry. And I think I'd, I'd done, I'd done the, the hors d'oeuvre, I'd done the pastry, I'd done the roast, and I'd done the cold fish. And I'd just moved on to the potage. And the potage was one of those sections that I, I really enjoyed because um, usually the Italians worked on the potage because it's the guys that made the pasta. So halfway down... Uh, uh, between the staircase, between the hot kitchen and the, the pastry, you had the pasta room. Mm -hmm. So every morning, if you're on the potage, you went to the pasta room, you start making pasta. So you make your tortellini, you make your ravioli, you make your money bags, oh, or wow. you tally tally everything. So you'd spend about three or four hours in there every day making all your pasta, and then you bring it up ready for service, you put it with your mise en place, and the other guys are upstairs making all the consommes and you know, blanching cannellonis and all that sort of stuff. And, and one of the guys that I was working with was this incredible Italian guy who's from northern Italy and I got on with him really, really well. And, um, and, and we had one of the most fantastic... You know when you meet somebody at work and you just think, stunning, you know, like yeah, great yeah, guy, yeah. really yeah. talented chef. He'd worked in a couple of star places out in, in, in uh, Italy and he'd come over to do his year at the Savoy. His English wasn't great. Right, mm -hmm. as as is most of the Italians that were working at the <laughs> time, they understood about fifty percent of what you said to them, which is fine. But you know, the, that that's just the way it was, and and um, it was one of those sort of situations where he was supposed to have put in his holiday form, right. okay, because oh. he wanted to go home for holiday, and he hadn't realised he was supposed to do it at least two weeks before he was going to take the holiday. So I, I remember the potage was right in front of Anton Edelman's office. Okay, and, um, and, and I remember him coming up to me and saying, oh, James, James, you know, I'm, 
I, I, I need to go on holiday. I said, well, have you done your form? And he said, he said, no. I said, mate, what are you oh, talking no. about? You're not going to be able to go on holiday. He goes, no, fuck that, I'm going on holiday. I'm like, no, 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 honestly, you're not going to. He said, I said, you're going to have to go and talk to chef. And he's like, no, I'm not going to talk to chef. <laughs> he's not going to let me go. No. I said, well, if you want to go without losing your job, you're going to have to go and talk to him. So anyway, so he goes in the office. Oh, right, God, and, can you imagine and, that feeling? Like, and, oh. and you just see like them going at it, bah, 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 and, and he comes out and he's like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I was like, well, look, let's do tonight's service and um, we'll see how it goes. Now, yeah. as we all know in service, you'll either have the best service yeah. or you'll have the worst <laughs> service. Yeah. There's never really a sort yeah. of like in between. It's either a good service or a bad service. No, that's an all right service. No, no, no. That's a good point. a good service or it was a bad service yeah, and that yeah. was always the way it was. And um, that night was a particularly bad service. Like <laughs> right. We ran out of quite a few bits of pasta oh, no. um, and, and uh, quite a few select words were said throughout the course <laughs> of, of the evening. Oh. So at the end of it, I think somebody turned around and said, you can go forget your effing holiday. Oh, <laughs> and, God. and he just went, he, he turned around and said, no, you can watch me take my effing holiday. And he took his hand and he put it in the middle of the bullseye. What? Yeah. What? Oh, what do you and mean? He lifted it up, and I can still remember oh. the sight of his skin stuck <laughs> to the middle of the bullseye, like burning. And he went, I'm going to the doctor's. <laughs> oh my God. And he ran out oh like this, God. like this, literally gone. Never saw him again, ever. <laughs> he didn't even come back. Mate, so that is he might as well have just walked out. He might as well just did a run out yeah. with his skin intact. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just, and, I'm going. <laughs> and, 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 and you just think to yourself, I mean, it could what? be a theatre, but... Just go home. <laughs> that is absolutely yeah. incredible. That was the craziest thing, I think. Shut well, one of the craziest things I've ever that. Yeah. No. That, that. Yeah. I thought like I that. thought you yeah. were just gonna say he, he just like quit on him, but the no. fact I mean it's sort of genius, like because it's gonna. <laughs> we're in a weird yeah. way. It wasn't genius. We had to smell smell the smell of his hand. Yeah. We're yeah. just scrubbing the bullseye yeah. later. Oh, oh, <laughs> God, his fingerprints are quite good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's insane. Yeah, so, what a story. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. Mental. Oh, I love it. it Smell like pork. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, mate. Wow. Great stories. So that was his boiling point. Yeah. Fucking hell. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> right. Um, okay, before we, uh, before we go, cooking hacks and myths. Uh, so any advice you can give to uh, esteemed chefs in their kitchens for little hacks that will help them out or any myths you want to dispel, like things people should stop doing because it makes no sense. So, so actually, this is quite... This is, if I go first. So, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, basically, right. I, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, I recently went down to Poor Thin Shellfish down in Cornwall so so we do like this producer visits with our with our chefs I took my head chefs from the west down to Port Thilly and they they, they produce some of the most incredible oysters I mean Paul uses them and, and Rick best loves them the best in the country Honestly, really? the, the most amazing but, mm. but I I worked at Jay Sheiky so I was sous chef at Jay Sheiky's for six years and we were best fish restaurant in the country we took the, the award away from Stein back in the, the early 2000s and it was mm. something that we were all very big about yeah. and we used to enter the Bebendum Oyster Opening ah, competition yeah. right and um, and we used to do very well at it but but I went to visit this uh, this oyster farm the guy that runs it he said um, we, we all stood there so all the, hef- she- the chefs are stood there and he said to me he said so we all know the easy way to open an oyster don't we and I'm like oh, yeah of course you've got <laughs> just, a knife in yeah. crack in yeah. he said what from the back like, yeah. Just, just, what, do, do your wrist not hurt at the end of it? Like, well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a bit. A bit. He goes, right. So I'll show you something. So <clears throat> you hold the rock oyster with the hinge behind you and the rock oyster there. On the right hand side of the oyster, you literally scrape the side of it off. It produces a little hole just big enough to put your oyster knife in. You put it in, you lift the really? hinge, and it's done. No way. Literally. Three seconds. I need to get some oysters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, and, and so you're holding it in your palm So you're holding there. your hand and yeah. you've got the hinge at so the So where back. you'd normally go in. Yeah, where you'd usually go in. You move around to the side, you scrape off the side of the shell and it exposes a tiny little air hole where it opens up. <laughs> you literally slide your knife in and you go, bop. And, How many and all of us stood there went, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> no, hang on. And, 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 and I'm surrounded by chefs that work for some of the most 
incredible chefs in the country, right, all look at us and go, <laughs> Oh, no. That's brilliant. Just, how um, many I'm, hundreds or thousands of voices? Would you have? Millions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, millions. And, and but just, was there a knack to it though? Like, is it yeah. one of those things? Was, yeah. You know, especially because I'm not the tallest. You kind of have to get up. It's all in exactly. the shoulder when yeah. they're small. Yeah. And then you're, then you're trying to you're trying to pop it up, and then you break the shell. Yeah. Oh, oh, you know, but yeah, literally. Or just, you dig it into your hands. Yeah, you literally just scrape off the side of the oyster, and you just go pop, oh, and it's shit. open. It's mad. I'm gonna get but, some in. Do it on social media and claim yeah. it's mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quick, guys, Hello. check this out. Quick, do this. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, Daniel. <laughs> Quick question though: Is there a bit, is there more of a knack to it though? Does it take a few to get that right? Because that makes it sound very easy. But was it really easy? He did it really easy. Really? Yeah. So basically, all he did was he yeah. took the oyster knife, he scraped off the side of the oyster, yeah. it, and he just, just pops went, open basically. No. Wow. Right. Yeah. Well, this has got to be everyone. Look so cool. When I show my <laughs> there might, well, there might be people listening right now that are going to do that job today. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. please film yourselves or yeah, let's, take pictures of yourselves. Now you get on. Send us, send us stuff because we want to see how that works. God, my out. hack is nowhere near as good as that. <laughs> yeah, well, what have you got? <laughs> it was. It, I saw it on TikTok. I was like, That's quite a cool little. <laughs> You're so down with the kids, mate. Someone who's not even a chef or anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, right, that's all, all right. Because. Um, you, microplanes are great, right? Yeah, yeah. And when you grate ginger on them, like nothing comes out and you have to scrape it. Yeah. You, you freeze the ginger and then do it, it comes out like parmesan. Oh, and nothing cool. all plunged, oh, yeah. plunged in the bottom. Oh, course, it's yeah. all just like oh, everything. No cool. loss, mm. no scraping. Yeah, that's the it. one thing that bugs me, even with garlic as well, where it all gets caught around the holes of things in and all smidge. Yeah. Yeah. Ginger's and then stringy. I'm like picking yeah, out yeah, my yeah, finger yeah. and it's all yeah. like annoying. With oh, ginger being stringy, that's why. And it is a difficult one, but yeah, freeze it and it's great. Honestly, Parmesan. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's Bob really on. Cool. Love it. These are uh, the best. Yeah. Ha- this is about to be the best <laughs> cookie hacks we've ever done on this show. <laughs> I mean, we should never do it again. That's incredible. Uh, oh, amazing. What an episode this has been. Thanks again to Guzborns uh, for providing us with tonight's nightcap. Uh, please visit their website now, guzborn.com, uh, to find out more about their special vintages. Wherever you are, however you're listening, thanks so much for downloading. And uh, James, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Thanks so much for coming. Pleasure. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, it's Cheers. Been great. We'll have a Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you.